are back here on Wooden Sticks. I am Kevin Gorg. You found the Talk North Podcast Network. Really excited today to have another great hockey conversation with a legend here in Minnesota. Bob Mason will be our guest today. Bob grew up in International Falls, played for the Broncos uh, back in the day. Uh, we're going back to the 70s here, and eventually we work his way uh, into Duluth to play for the UMD Bulldogs in the early 80s. Would go on to a uh, stellar National Hockey League career. Was a goaltender with Washington, Chicago, the Quebec Nordiques, and the Vancouver Canucks. And then I would get to know Bobby later in life. He had been the uh, goaltending coach for 18 years for the Minnesota Wild. Started back in 2002. Got hired by the great Jacques Lemaire in that time frame and would last multiple coaching changes up through 2020 when he retired. Uh, scratch golfer, terrific guy. Always enjoyed my conversations with Bob Mason. He's uh, he he doesn't get right to it. He's a very um, he's methodical the way he brings out interesting points. But when you work as a sideline reporter like I have now for 18 years covering the team, is you like to plug into that goalie coach and get some perspective from behind the scenes and what they're working on. And you know he worked with some great goalies from Nicholas Backstrom through Devin Dubnik, going back to Manny Fernandez and Dwayne Rollison, those two guys rotating in that magical run to the conference finals in 03. And Bobby's just a very, very interesting guy. And so looking forward to hearing about um, working for Jacques Lemaire, working in this organization for nearly two decades and surviving the coaching changes. He and Darby Hendrickson were the coaches that no matter who the, the bench boss was, they wanted them on their staff. So that's a real credit to what kind of coaches – both Bob and Darby are. And then I, I really can't wait to talk about the uh, the epic game. It was about this time of year, and back in 1987, It's it's been tabbed the Easter epic. And for you kids out there that maybe don't have that, that history at your disposal, you can Google this. It's incredible. It was a game seven, winner take all in the Stanley Cup playoffs. And going back to the mid-'80s, hockey had just kind of made the move to live, nationally televised, playoff games. We didn't have the type of setup we have now. A lot of times in the early 80s, I was watching playoff games on tape delay. Unless it was the local team, back then it was the North Stars, you didn't get a lot of -of out-of-town games live. You got them tape delay uh, at weird hours, 10 o'clock at night, midnight, 2 o'clock in the morning, didn't matter. So this particular game was center stage. There were no other playoff games going on in 1987, Easter weekend, Doc Emmerich and Bill Clement were on the call. So you had the A-team. And then you have the longest game seven in the history of the National Hockey League. And Bob Mason was in goal for the Washington Capitals. Kelly Rudy in goal for the New York Islanders. A fantastic, fantastic hockey game that would go quadruple overtime. It started on Saturday. It ended Easter Sunday morning at the wee hours out east at the Cap Center in Landover, Maryland. Just, ugh. The game, thinking back on that, it was just such an awesome game to watch. 75-57 to were the shots on goal. Caps outshot them. Kelly Rudy and Bob Mason dueling to the wire. And finally, Pat LaFontaine, another name, of course, that's tied to Minnesota hockey. And for all of us that are even still, we should probably let it go, but even still to this day frustrated that our good friend and former guest on our show, Lou Nanny, selected um, as the first overall pick in the draft. And you got to think about, again, where the North Stars were at that time. They had had some pretty good playoff success. And Pat LaFontaine was widely considered to be one of the two or three guys at the top of the draft. The, the North Stars would end up taking Brian Lawton. And at the time, that pick made sense because if you looked at a lot of the publications nationally and I read the hockey news back in the day. It was a coin flip between LaFontaine and the guy we took. And the guy we took ended up being an okay player. Uh, Brian Lott and I, you know, I've seen him around at, at uh, wild games to this day and he's working for the NHL network. Super nice guy. But uh, LaFontaine ended up being an unbelievable player. Guy named Steve Ayers been a little later in the draft, I believe that year. So North star fans still hold that as a name that brings back, some old wounds. So Pat LaFontaine held the puck in at the blue line. There was traffic in front of Bob Mason and rifled that puck that just seemed to have eyes as it navigated its way through the the mass of humanity in the slot. And it it looked to me, and we'll get to the the definitive answer today on the show, Bob Mason maybe never saw that puck. 
but it legitimately is one of the greatest games in the history of the league. And like I mentioned, longest game seven ever. And uh, of course the guys on the call made the broadcast that much more enjoyable for all of us that were able to watch that game. Bob Mason was a player of the year in the WCHA. I didn't know that until I started digging in and doing some research after the 82, 83 season, he was voted as the, uh, the most valuable player in that league. And this is back in the league when they were, players up and down each roster that were superstars that would go on to play in the National Hockey League. So Bob was one hell of a goalie and uh, always great stories with Bob Mason. And I really am excited to hear someone went into some of those big decisions. And I look back at his time as a goaltending coach with uh, the Minnesota Wild in that particular season in 03 when they upset both Colorado and Vancouver. If you recall, it was two different goalies. And I don't think the opposition knew which way the wild were, were going to go. It was Manny Fernandez one night. It was Dwayne Rolison the next. It was Manny Fernandez for two or three games. Then it was Rolison for two or three games. And they made a huge difference in both those series. I look back at game seven uh, in Colorado. Manny Fernandez stood on his head. He was remarkable in that hockey game. Uh, tremendous performance. And then Dwayne Rolison kind of took over in the next series. When Vancouver was a huge favorite, that one would also go seven. In full series, Minnesota would come back from 3-1 deficits. Bob Mason was right there. He was living it with Jacques Lemaire, Mario Tremblay, Mike Ramsey. So some great stuff today on Wooden Sticks. We'll put him on the hat trick hot seat, and uh, we'll have some just awesome hockey conversations that start in International Falls, work their way to Duluth, and then departs all over the National Hockey League, including the Easter Epic. As we get ready to celebrate Easter again this year, we'll look back on one of the all-time great games in the National Hockey League, and Bob Mason was in the crease for that unbelievable hockey game. Hey, if you want to be a part of the show, we'd love to have you. We're still looking for a title sponsor and anybody else that wants to be a part of the show. All you've got to do is send a quick note to Karen Cleary at K-C-L-E-A-R-Y. Cleary at talknorth.com. Be a part of the show. When we come back, Bob Mason, our next guest right here on Wooden Sticks. We are back on the Talk North Network. This is Wooden Sticks. I'm your host, Kevin Gorg. Very excited for our guest today. He is uh, from International Falls, longtime college NHL goaltender and, and longtime goaltending coach with the Minnesota Wild for 18 years from 2002 through 2020. My good friend, Bobby Mason. Bob, welcome to the show. Great uh, having me. I mean, let me tell you, it's, we used to see each other every day, and now I, I'd see it maybe once a summer. <laughs> It's tough. Yeah, I don't get on the golf course like I used to. You're not around the rink as right. much as you obviously were. 18 years, you know, I look at you and Darby Hendrickson, Bob, as uh, kind of unicorns in the NHL business. And I've been on the beat since 2006 covering this team. But you don't see specialty coaches that stick around and last through multiple coaching changes. Yet, I look at your tenure with the Minnesota Wild, which started all the way back when Jacques Lemaire was the head coach. I look at what Darby Hendrickson is still doing. I believe you made it through three or four. He's made it through five or six different coaches. Why do you think that's possible? Because it just does not happen in this league. Yeah, that's a good question. Darby was, I was talking to him about that. the other. I think we both had six. Darby's on six right now. So I said, just be oh careful. My goodness. <laughs> um, you know, we're just, you know, you, you, get, you get along with the, uh, just your niche of what I do. I mean, I, you know, I've, obviously I work with the D, work with the forwards, work with the goalies most of the time. Uh you know, doing, you know, D drills with the goalies or shooting drills. So you, you just had a rapport with everybody and it was kind of a, you know, a, a easy going rapport. I mean, it wasn't like a hardcore, you know, head coach has got to get down on these guys, you know, PK coach, PP coach, you know, they got to get a little, little Benham going once in a while. I, I kind of stayed away from that. And, you know, that's how I was, you know, when I was coached, you, you know, my top guy was Warren Stralo from Montamita. I mean, Warren was, Warren was always a positive guy and, and, you know, he was always a go-between guy. You know, he did the same thing, you know, working with the forwards, working with the D, working with the goalies. Um, so you kind of get in that lane and it's, um, you know, if you have success, you know, you're going to stick around for a while and, you know, you have good goaltenders, you, you know, good scouts or you, you pick the right people. And, and uh, I had a lot of good goaltenders through, through those years. And um, that, that made it a lot easier. What was it like working for a legendary coach like Jacques Lemaire? Well, Jock was, I mean, I watched, God, I was watching him in high school, you know, when he was a, you know, the big cup winning Canadians, you know, we would get up in International Falls, we'd get Hockey Night in Canada and we, you know, 
mm-hmm. that was our that was our channel. We couldn't get the North Star games, but we get Montreal Toronto games every Saturday night. So <laughs> uh I got the job. My dad went my dad called me because God, you're gonna be working with Jacques Lemaire, you know. Cause he was just he was one of the guys with the you know with the, with the, with the big bad canadians back in those days so he was you know jock let you do i mean i remember coming in for a meeting with him and um i walked into 317 washington i'd done my contract with risebro this was like in june and doug said i want to hire you you're gonna have to talk to jock when he comes to town in August. So I had to wait all summer. So I did the Devo camp up and you know, we, we did the Devo camp up in Brainerd, you know, it was a three week camp up there. So I was up there for three weeks uh, with Mario. So I got to know Mario Tremblay and then Rammer was coaching. Um, and then Jock comes to town. I go down to 317, meet him. I, I remember walking into the, the office there and I was just gonna pull the door open and Tobin Wright was kind of video coach, kind of team coordinator. Tobin opens it and Jock's right there. And Tobin, I remember Tobin said, Dave, hey, coach, this is uh, Bob Mason. I remember Jock going, I didn't pitch you looking like this. <laughs> so I, I think he visually had me looking like a different guy. So anyway, he just said, let's go down to the, let's go down to the, my office at, at uh, Excel Center and uh, let's, uh, let's watch some tape. So we, the t- two tapes were, were Manny and uh, Roly. So we just kind of went over Manny a little bit, went over Roly a little bit and um, not long. It was just, some questions and I just did some commentating on, on just what they were doing. And, and Jock said, you know what you're talking about? And then bang, that was it. And that was, I signed a deal there. I think a three-year deal right away. So, but on he was a little bit later. Yeah. Yeah. He was, you know, he working with, yeah, he was, you know, he, he was uh, kind of, you, you get kind of had to get into a circle a little bit. He was a tight, sure. a tight circle, you know, so it was Mario was t- always tight with him and then Rammer got in tight and then, Took me a little bit, but you know, it was just he was. Thank God, Manny and Rolly were were playing pretty dang good, and, and uh, you know, I kept him out of my hair a little bit, I guess. Uh, so I didn't really ever catch the wrath of Jock. I mean, once in a while he he'd get on you, but uh, um, as long as the goalies were playing good, you were you were in good form. Well, and in two thousand three, they were playing fantastic. So whatever you were working on was working, and it was so unique at that time because. I look back at that era of the NHL, which di- is different than where we are now, Bob, but, you know, rotating goalies specifically in the playoffs was almost unheard of. And you guys not only did it, but you did it with some huge success, big upset victories against Colorado and Vancouver. How did those discussions go as, as you guys mapped out a plan for the playoffs and then executed that plan with, with both Manny Fernandez and Dwayne Rollison playing, you know, such a equal role. Yeah, they were equal. Um, uh, I think, you know, Manny Roly started the Colorado series and at the end of the series, it was kind of Manny that took over. And then it was almost the exact the opposite with Vancouver. Manny, Manny kind of started and Roly kind of took that series over. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, we talked a lot every, I mean, we you know, coaching staff, we go out for dinner every night and we would bring up the goalies. Who are we going to start? <laughs> Jock would say, who are we going to start, Mace? I said, well, I said, let's see. Roly played pretty good. He won. Um, uh, but that first, yeah, the, I, I'm not sure exactly why we went, started with Roly. Um, but it was tough cause we're down three to one. And then I think Roly played part of game five and, and he got, how oh, we think we took him out. And then Manny went in, uh, five, six and seven. And Manny was, you know, hadn't played in two weeks. And I just remember he was really, really nervous. You know, he was always a little nervous anyway, but, um, he was like, "No, God, now it's now it's on my plate, Mace." I said, "Well, it's it it just happens. It's going to be on your plate." I said, "You got nothing to lose, everything to gain." I said, "Just you're good. You're going to be nervous. Once you make that first save, you're going to slide right into it." And boy, five, six, and seven, he was fantastic. And those are clutch games, five, six, and seven. My God, he was well. My, game he, seven, Bob. I mean that that's one of the greatest performances by a wild goaltender in the history of the franchise, it might be the greatest performance. If you go back and look and watch game seven, he was remarkable in that game in Denver. Yeah, he was, you know, he was, yeah, it was like 30, what was it? Four, three, we won, I think. Um, yep. Uh, 30. Or was it three, two? It was, I think it might've been four, three. I think they went up three, two. I remember Darby took the penalty late in the third kind of, seven eight ten minutes to go 
And we got a power play and scored, tied it. I think it was 3-3. And then Bruno scores in overtime. But, uh, yeah, Manny was – I think he was 34 out of 37 that night. I just – I remember the, the glove save on Rob Blake. You know, he kind of made the rush up the ice. He got it, you know, 10 feet inside the blue line full speed, and he just zipped one. And Manny, Manny did the old Ken Dryden, just a gorgeous glove save. <laughs> You know, that was such a fun hockey game. Yeah. I mean, for all of us that had our hearts ripped out when the North stars left, I look at that night is the night we finally put the the ghosts of hockey past to bed. Like it it was a really big moment for a lot of us of a certain age because the wild became our team that night. That was a turning point and uh, it was early on. Right. I mean, the team was new and uh, you just took down one one of the best teams. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing that you, you won that series. What was it like in the aftermath? Like, what was the celebration like on the way to the next series? Because, I mean, you guys basically shocked the hockey world that night. Yeah, we did. I mean, um, I think Vancouver was – they, they might have had a game seven, too, with St. Louis that year. They came back right. and beat. They came back and beat uh, St. Louis. I can't remember what if – we, if we flew right up to Van or if we came home and then went to Van. I can't remember what we did there. It was a long time ago, but uh, and the games uh, were more sandwiched together back then. You had some back-to-back games within those series. Yeah, we had six and seven with Vancouver back-to-back. Six here and Crazy. seven in Vancouver. Right? Up, yeah, we were. You know, I, we were on that bus and the bus T-boned that limo <laughs> going to I the. I remember rink. that story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't that was, easy. No, it wasn't easy. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was. I mean, some of those are quick turnarounds, and then the, then. Even that series was a huge, quick turnaround. After Game Seven in Vancouver, we stayed overnight in Vancouver, flew back to Mini, and then we played the next afternoon at two o'clock against the Ducks, and we lost yeah, a double on overtime. TV, game. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, so it was they, crazy. They dictated the time, and you know, it would have been nice to have another day off, you know, because we just played two games, you know, seven two game seven series back to back. Yeah, I mean, who knows? We win that first game, you know. Maybe we get the finals. We had home ice against them, and you know, Gabrick had the. I mean, we had glorious chances, and Shagir was, you know, obviously he was the Conn Smythe winner that year. They lost to the Devils in seven in the finals, but he he was a Conn Smythe winner, and and he won, he even won that series against. You know, we 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 didn't play a bad. We just couldn't score. No, you know, it was I, like two, you all two play rip, them almost two, every night. Two rip, one rip, two rip, two one. I think it was something like that. So yeah, close that games. was the big equipment. That was that was, I think, part of the the uh, the information they used to to get the goaltending equipment uh, kind of uh, tightened up a little bit because he was almost too good. It was ridiculous how hard it was to to beat him. And I, you know, I look at your your tenure as as wild goalie coach, and I think a lot of people know you as that guy. But I think most people that are of a certain age like me remember you playing for the UMD Bulldogs. Uh, playing in the National Hockey League. But how did it all start, Bobby? How did you not only come to hockey, but how did you want to become a goalie? How did that conversation go when you were a kid? Well, he didn't start as a goalie. You know, I had a twin, you know, twin brother, Billy. So we had a, you know, hmm. we had a nice long basement with a tiled floor that, you know, we go down and, you know, it was probably a 50 foot long uh, basement floor and we could shoot tennis balls. And I was always a goalie, you know. <laughs> And Billy was a shooter, and we'd go down there between periods, hockey night can every Saturday. Period over, we'd go down there, and he'd shoot, he'd shoot tennis balls on me for you know twenty minutes. And um, but when we were playing rack hockey, I was I was a forward, just didn't need a goalie. And then uh, I just I distinctly remember it. It was just one night he was sick. I jumped in a net, and I think we won the game. Didn't have a great team, but uh, played pretty good. And I I was probably fifth grade, maybe. And okay. Then I just, stuck in there and just uh you know we had got then growing up i'm watching i don't remember the name peter wasilovich yes was i do all state guy 71 72 73 i think he was an all-stater it was him at pete lepressi pete was at evleth so i got i watched i was always watching those two guys and uh you know peter went to wasilovich went to north dakota and lepressi went to denver um but i remember you know peter was the god you watch them. And then, then the next wave came in about uh, two years. Kevin Constantine came in. Yep. And Kevin was, you know, fantastic. He, you know, that was our video back then, Gorgie. We didn't have video. Our, my video was I just remember. Watching, my video was just watching these guys and trying to play like them. That's what I, that's how I try to pick up styles and everything. So, um, 
so I mean that anyway. That, that's how I just I just stuck in there and rec hockey, and then bang, I'm doing bantams. I'm doing you know, you know, Pee Wee's bantams in high school, and uh, I always had I always had to play another year of bantam bees because I the other two guys I had in front of me was David Lorian, played at Notre Dame. Yes, uh, David was you know David played Kevin constantly. Kevin played two and a half years as a starter, and then David came in one year as a starter. And then it was my turn the next year. So 79. David was 78. Kevin was 76, 77. Um, so I, you know, played pretty good. I think we lost we lost the Rapids in section seven finals. It was oh, man. John Casey. And um I uh just didn't have enough games under my belt. So uh I almost went to junior college and then I took a route. I had a buddy going to Green Bay, Wisconsin to play for the Green Bay Bobcats. And uh he got me a phone number for a guy and I just say, I'm just, you know, I'm, I think Green Bay had kind of International Falls area. So it wasn't, it wasn't even a draft. It was just kind of areas. So I went there and, you know, made that team play, you know, like close to a hundred games in two years there. And I got pretty good. And, uh, you know, that's when you got, all of a sudden you got a bunch of college scouts looking at you. Then you get some pro scouts looking at you. I'm, you know, I'm coming from nowhere. And Those all are of a sudden key years, Bobby. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not like, I'm barely playing high school. And a year and a half later, I got all these people coming to watch me in green Bay. And I'm like, so that's a quick it turned. And that really motivated me. It was like, Holy God, these guys are coming to town. You know, Gump Worsley was coming to town. Bernie Perrant with Philly was coming to town to watch me play juniors. Wasn't drafted that year, which turned out to be a blessing, but I was a little disappointed, but I wasn't. And, uh, um, that's when that Gus led Anderson. you to UMD, though. That 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 time in Green Bay gave you the chance to become a part of the UMD hockey program. And I didn't know this, Bobby. All these years, and you know, I watched you play forever, and, and especially in the National Hockey League, I didn't realize you were the WCHA Player of the Year for UMD after the eighty two eighty three season. Now that is a hell of an accomplishment in that league at that time with all those great players talk about yeah. that experience for you as a UMD goalie that, that had that type of success. Well, just, you just, you know, it was highly motivated weekend hockey. I mean, you, you just like Rammer always said, you in college hockey, you let the, the animals out of the cage on Friday and you're ready. You're just like, <laughs> nobody's tired. Right. You know, it would, Rammer always talked juniors to college, you know, the juniors are playing all week and then we were just weekend guys. And we were just like, Boy, you couldn't wait to go. And, you know, I think that sophomore year I played 46 out of the 48 games. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, we have number one team in the country for about three weeks at that one time. You know, Kerbers, Tommy was there. And, you know, we had Greg Moore from uh, Edina that was playing really well. We had, uh, you know, Watson and Adnacon came into town. Uh, Norm McIver was there. So we had some pretty good players. But, I mean, the Gophers were solid. Wisconsin was good. North Dakota was good. We finished the fourth. At, I think we were fourth in the league that year. But we we beat North Dakota like – I think we played each other at that time. We played them six times. We beat them five, I think. But, you know, you just – you're, you know, player of the week. You know, all of a sudden you're player of the week again. Then a couple of weeks go by, then you're player of the week again. So I was kind of racking those things up. I was – you know, we were winning and, you know, I was stopping a lot of pucks. And uh, um, it was funny because I remember I was – we lost at Providence in the NCAA quarterfinals out at Providence – um, Lou Lamarillo was coaching Providence. It was was a two game total goal series back then. So I mean, Surdy Surdy grabs me after the game. He said, "Hey, USA Hockey wants you to fly to Tokyo. You got to go up to Boston, go go over to World Championships." So the goalies were the the, the U.S. team that year. Were um, Jimmy Craig came back. Jimmy was trying to get back in the league, and then Paul Lotsby wow. was was a backup. So I flew over, and um, that's I'm reading the. I was sitting in the lunchroom and John Harrington was on that team. And he came over to me. He said, Hey, I, it was the USA today clippings it said, Minnesota it said sophomore goaltender, Bob Mason wins WCHA MVP. <laughs> That's wow. how he found out. And Surdy won coach of the year that year. Surdy was, it was my little headline and then Mike Surdich, Mike Surdich named coach of the year WCHA. That's right. Holy cow. I found, and- that out, found that out in Tokyo. Crazy. You're in Tokyo. You get the you get the update from Harrington and it, Coach Sertich had to be just a trip to play for. I always enjoyed my conversations with him over the years and just watching him behind the bench 
at UMD, the passion he had for hockey and just how much fun it looked he, like he was having. Yeah, he was – first year was – he was assistant. It was Gus Hendrickson, and Gus was a, you know, legendary Iron Ranger from Rapids. And um, uh, Gus, yeah, it was weird. He got let go of that spring of that my freshman year, and Surdy was – Surdy was going to leave, just get out of hockey because he was a recovery. He was, you know, hitting the, hitting the beer too much. He was going to – you know, he did go to rehab, but he was going to get out of hockey, just get do something else. And Ralph Romano was the AD at the time. And Ralph, uh, uh, I don't think he had a plan when he fired Gus. <laughs> he went to <laughs> he went to Surdy and Surdy said, I'll take it for one year, interim coach. Well, he was coach year, coach year, coach year, his first three years. You know, and I'm spending, what, 17 years as a head there. Uh, but yeah, yes. he was, Surdy was a motivator. Let me tell you, God, could he motivate that locker room? You know, for a good X and O guy, you know, he knew his hockey. Big time. Sure you know, did. He had, he had a good eye, but he was a very good, just a, uh, his, his speeches that just motivate you. And, 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 you know, we, we were, we were tight. I mean, we had a tight team and all those years up there. I mean, I mean, he, he was unlucky not to win. He could have won two NCAA tournaments, you know, back to back. They lost to Bowling Green in 84 and what, four overtimes. And uh, yep. the next year, I think they lost to, uh, I think our, well, who beat them in '85? That's when Holly was in there. Brett Hall's first year. I think they lost our yeah, they had a good team. in Detroit. Yeah, they. But Surdy, yeah, he was rock solid, and he was, you know, um, you know, he was. Then he went to Tech. You know, everybody leaves. You know, and he, you know, it wasn't a happy ending for him. I think at Duluth, you know, it should have been a, you know, a celebration of his coaching career, and it was kind of a the opposite when he when he got out of there. It was kind of. Uh, sad deal that happened, but you know, I think he's meant at everything there. He's, he, I've seen him at games there, and so, uh, and Sandy S- Sandlin loves him too. So, Sandy's really kind of brought him back into the fold a little bit. Wonderful guy. And at yeah. what point when you were growing up, did pro hockey hit your radar? You end up playing for Washington, Chicago, Quebec, and Vancouver. But you know, when you're growing up in the National Falls, I'm, I'm certain that the next biggest thing is you just want to play in Bronco Arena and play you know, high school hockey. And then you're like, you said, you went to green Bay, hoping that something would work out there. You didn't get drafted. When did pro hockey really become something that was a realistic goal for you, Bob? Well, it was that, that second year in green Bay was, you know, Mm -hmm. when all these scouts were coming in there. Um, um, And then I was, you know, then I, like I said, the next step was Duluth. A lot of, a lot of scouts coming to those games. Um, like I said, it, it turned out to be a blessing being a free agent and then I make the Olympic team. So I played two years at Duluth yep. Olympic trials, 83, summer of 83, Colorado Springs at the Rodmore go in there and, you know, knock out, you know, we had, God, we had two givens. Tommy Brasso was a given spot and Mark Barron, the all American from Wisconsin. They had the two, they were guaranteed two spots. So it was like, you know, six goalies for a spot. Maybe, maybe if they keep three. Wow. Well, I go out there. Brad Buteau was our coach in the West team. We win the we win the tournament. My partner was Cleon Daskalakis, all American at BU. Cleon hurts his knee game one, so I played three and a half games, go three and all, and oh. uh, championship game. I think I kicked forty out of forty, four nothing win. Oh you know, wow! Buteau's just loving it. He's hugging me, and you know I'm saying it's easy, Brad. So Lam- uh, Lou Vero was the head coach, and Luke comes into the room. He said. We got our goalies picked, but if I don't pick you, I'm going to look like the dumbest guy on the on the planet. So you're going to be picked. I'm going to pick you tomorrow. You're going to be one of our three. So I said, great. So that's, you know, then we, you know, we had the three headed monster with myself, Brasso, and Barron, and then Tommy. You know, we had played the Soviet Wings up in Anchorage and Fairbanks in September. Tommy played a couple of games in Fairbanks. Remember, he flies back to Massachusetts for his sister's wedding. And the Sabres sign him. So he's got. So That's we were, right. You know, yeah. We were, yeah. So we were, you know, just two on the team. And then I knew, you know, I was, I was You're locked in. Play. Yeah. I mean, I, so the, the big question was, am I going to go back? If I don't get picked, am I going to go back to UMD or am I going to sign pro? Because I, I had just hired Brian Burke was my agent. I just hired Berkey. Berkey's like, Mace, you got, I got four offers right now to sign you. Oh, wow. So, um, 
you know, thank God that road didn't happen because I, I didn't know what I was going to do if I would have went back to school or not. Probably would have signed because, you know, I was a free agent and, you know, I had the the height of my earning, you know, my power there for, for a contract. Um, so anyways, for play sure. the whole year out and, um, yeah, the Devils, Caps, I, going to Washington, Strela was probably a major factor in that. Um, hmm. And pretty good team, you know, they had Scott Stevens, really Rod Langley. Yeah, Rod Langley, Scott Stevens, you know, Kevin Hatcher, Larry Murphy, you know, pretty good deep core back there. So uh, <laughs> that was kind of an easy choice. Turned out a little bit of money, though. It took a little less going to Washington than than going to New Jersey. But the Devils but were – But you had the security of Strelo and that blue line that you knew would be a, a probably an easier transition. Exactly. And that, you played in four cities. I mentioned them. Washington, yeah. Chicago, Quebec, and Vancouver. Take the hockey out of it. And I've been to three of these frequently. I have not ever been to Quebec. What was your favorite place to live? Hmm. Probably downtown Chicago. Oh, yeah. Enough. Yeah. Funny, when I got there, uh, I was coming out 87 Canada Cup. So I was a third goalie on that team. It was Team USA, 87 Canada Cup. It was uh, Van Beesbrook, Tommy Brasso, and myself for the three goalies. So I was third man, just signed a big deal with the Blackhawks that summer, free agent. Um, kind of got out of shape because nobody was skating. And I get right. to camp. I just remember I get to camp and I was didn't know where to live. Eddie Olchuk just gets traded to Toronto. So Eddie goes, I got a place out in Naperville. Why don't you move into my house? So I did that. I did that for like three weeks. And it was like, you know, the traffic there was like, it took me an hour and a half to get to Chicago Stadium. So I ended up moving Ooh. downtown in a high rise, uh, a couple of floors under uh, Kurt Frazier. Remember Fraz? Oh, yeah. Bill Norris. Yeah. So uh, me and Fraz live in the same building. So that was the funnest. It was kind of cool down there. My wife uh, wasn't married at the time, but Victoria was a flight attendant with Northwest. So she was down there a lot, and uh, yeah, it was good, good, good times. Best team, though, Chicago best Stadium. Team. Yeah, I mean, just the city and the stadium, place to live. I like that the best. Probably like playing the best in Washington. You know, Vancouver was solid, but I was just kind of back and forth. I was with the Milwaukee Admirals, so I was kind of up and down, up and down. And then Quebec was, you know, Quebec was kind of fun too. You know, we, we had a pretty good team, but we we, we just didn't. How many points? I mean, I mean, Goulet was there. Joe Sackick's first year. We had the That's Stasny right. brothers, Anton and Peter Stasny. Oh. And Mario Mario Goslin was my partner. The goose, uh, the goose. The goose. Yeah, he was uh, free and easy. That guy was. But uh, <laughs> that was that was uh, that wasn't. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah, a lot of snow up there, Gorgi. Holy, I thought International Falls had snow. It snowed in Quebec City. I mean, four to midnight every day. Really. Oh my God. It was scary how much snow they had up there. I need to get there. And I, I, I think the old building, the Coliseum is still there. I'd love to see it sometime. I've heard nothing but great stories just about, you know, cause back then when we got to watch playoff games, if, if you caught a Montreal Quebec playoff game, there was nothing like it. Yeah. Quebec, Hartford, Quebec, Boston, that Adams yes. division was, yeah. Those teams were all loaded. pretty good back then. Yeah, they were loaded. They were all – you mentioned some of the names. I mean, the Nordiques had some fantastic players. And, you know, back then Boston had some some great teams. Hartford uh, was Neil, still competitive. Neely, Bork, you know, yes. yeah, Reggie Lemelin. Was it Andy the Moe. Adams division? Adams division, yeah. Then he had Mike Lee. Yeah, then he had, you know, Ray Ferraro, Dean, Dean Everson, Ray Ferraro. Those guys were all on uh, Hartford. I knew all those guys because when I, my first year in Washington, our farm team was in Binghamton, and we were – 10 guys from Washington, 10 guys from Hartford. So of all those course. guys were down there. Yeah, all those guys were down there. That's the first first time I met. Well, Dean actually, Dean was a, a Washington Capitol draft pick. And then he was traded for, uh, God, who was he traded for? I think David A. Jensen, the Olympic player, out East guy. Because Dean spent most of his career in Hartford. He did. With, yeah, early on. With uh, Tex oh, Evans, yeah, Larry, just... Larry Plo, yeah. Yeah. Well, the timing of our conversation is spectacular because, you know, the Easter epic is still one of the all-time legendary NHL games. And for the youngsters that are listening, we're going back to Easter weekend, 1987. And, you know, back then, hockey on national TV was a new thing. But this game in particular was a game seven. The Islanders and Pat LaFontaine, as you mentioned, against Bob Mason and the Washington Capitals, winner take all. 
Mike Emmerich and Bill Clement were on the call, uh, combined 132 shots on goal, and it's still the longest game seven in the history of the National Hockey League. At the time of this game, Bobby, it ended up being the longest game since 1951. Now, there have been longer playoff games since, but this was quadruple overtime. And I got to ask you, just competing in a game like that, when, let's face it, nutrition back in the mid-'80s isn't what it is now. Like, we know a lot more now how to keep these players hydrated, how to keep them fed. This is a game that went from a Saturday night, the weekend of Easter, into Easter morning. And I can't imagine for you, who never gets a break, the goalie, you're out there the entire time, how you manage to stay hydrated and stay upright and stay stay strong mentally and physically in a game like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's – we were – like drinking salt water, I think. <laughs> I think we, I, th- <laughs> I think we ran out of Gatorade. <laughs> yeah, we had our nutritionist in there. Yeah, oh, everybody drink salt water. You know, so we were like, that yeah. was a I thing mean, we back had, then. I remember that. Yeah, we drink. Yeah, it was tasted terrible to really oh, it was hydrate awful. you. Yeah, so we were. I mean, back then, guy, we were drinking Coke between periods. I mean, always for sure. There were of, guys, guys smoking in the locker room. A, oh yeah. So. Yeah, that was. Uh, I think I lost fifteen pounds when I weighed myself like the next day. It was I believe like it negative fifteen pounds. So I was down, I was a bone rack. I was down to nothing. Oh yeah, well, you know you're just on adrenaline though. You know you were. I didn't didn't cramp up. You know I think I cramped up when I I think getting out of the shower. I think my putting on my shoes. I think after the game, my my bottom of my feet start cramping up. But I never cramped up during the whole game. It was crazy. You know, but I was what probably twenty seven ish at that time. So I was yeah cramping never cramping never hit me till I was like thirty, but. But yeah, that game was. I was talking to David Poyle. Oh, I was maybe a year ago at the one of those USA Hockey banquets, and he said he just he came over. We brought that game up right away. He said that that game will never be broken because there's never going to be a. There was one penalty called in four four overtime periods for from Andy Van Helman, and it was a four. Wow. So it just went four and four. So nobody nobody had power play. And it was like a David Poyle. David I said the same thing. David said, "Mace, so it was like a football game out there. Guys are getting tackled." And, you know, oh, back then it was, you know, a lot of stick fouls. and, and uh, They let was... more go on for sure. Oh, and, totally. You know, you think of quadruple overtime, that's seven periods of hockey. You're two games plus another period on on your body. And, and then I think of the mental side of things, Bobby, just the stress. This isn't, you know, just some throwaway game in a series that's been decided. This is game seven. This is, yeah. you know, win or go home. And, and with that type of pressure, I, I just don't know how you stay into that moment. And sure. Adrenaline probably keeps you going as far as the physical part of things, but the stress mentally, what were the conversations like in the intermissions? Like do the coaches run out of things to say? Yeah, they weren't even coming in. You know, they were, it was just, you know, we were resting and, and trying to hydrate and, and, uh, you know, Brian, Brian Murray was a coach. Brian would come in and, you know, just say five minutes ago, he'd say a couple of words, but, uh, um, yeah, it was, you know, we had a three, one lead in the series though. You know, I know. Pete Peters played one and two at home. We split, go to long Island. I played three and four, two, nothing win three, two win, come back to cap center for game five. We're up 3-1. I think Brian thought we were going to wrap it up that night. Didn't play me. Played Pete. Lost 4-2. Then I played game six back at Nassau County. We end up losing 4-2 open net goal. And we got game seven back at the cap center. And they said, Mace, you're going. So, Oh, man. Um, but it was, yeah, it was uh, – yeah, I mean, we. I don't know what happened. I mean, I I did not bring that up to David Poyle when why I didn't play game five. Game five. No, I should, probably I not. I should have. No, oh, that was about a year ago. I should have. You know, God rest Brian Murray's soul. Brian was a hell of a coach. Brian was. Yeah, he was a fantastic coach. But they had Al Arbor, pretty smart coach too. Pretty good coach, right? One of the all time greats. That was, and- that was the first year Billy Smith was not playing. Kelly Rudy took over the reins for uh, playoff. That was the first year Billy sat on the bench. So remember after game I watched seven, every minute of it. He came over. I remember I'm kind of sitting, you know, they're all celebrating and we're kind of just in days and I'm just sitting on my one knee in the crease and 
Billy Smith would never ever if you remember this, he never shook hands with the other team after the series. He just go off the ice. He goes, I'm not gonna shake Which hands. Was weird. Yeah. So he he so coming out, our net was by their exit area, and he skates over to me. And I look down, I see those blue Billy Coho pads. Billy Smith is where I'm going, shit, that's Billy Smith. <laughs> and he, he grabbed my hand, he shook my hand, he goes, best goaltending game I've ever seen in my life. He said, Keep it up. Oh then, man. Then, then he skated off. Yeah. So. Well, I you know, I watched in the game. I was watching with Marco Seek and some other buddies from from Burnsville, and we were cheering for you guys, the Minnesota goalie thing. Plus, we were so bitter about the Islanders. We did the North Stars in the Cup a handful of years earlier. We were all in on the caps. And it looked to me on that that winning goal, and I remember it vividly where LaFontaine, he, he barely holds the puck in high in the slot. There's like five bodies in between him and you in the net. It looked to me like you never saw the puck, Bob, on that winning goal. Yeah, it was just a... I think it was Gord Deneen went around the net and he from right to left and got over on the left side and he threw it out. And I think Kevin Hatcher was out there. I think him and Langway were paired up and uh, he kind of ricocheted off. You know, he, he long sticked, kind of went right off his stick. Right, Pat, I think Pat was going off the ice for a line change. And he took a look and the puck's just floating out to me. So he kind of did the little 360 spin around and he, he one timed it and yeah, went. Like yeah, it was. I, I mean, look at it now. I was deep in the net, but uh, uh, I didn't see anything. It just hit the post and uh, game over. So, but the the, the, the net- tying the tying goal, Gorgie was let like five minutes ago in the third, and Trache came in and he was on the right side on his backhand, and he he let a backhander go from you know just below the faceoff dot, and I'm kind of you know we were. We weren't butterflies sliding back then. We were just kind of shuffling across. And my the rivet in my Langoli skate broke on my right leg, my right ankle, and my l- ankle buckled, and the puck went five hole. And Van Helman. Oh, it was, no way. Yeah. So Andy comes over and I said, Is there something wrong with my skate, Andy? I said, I, I don't, I, the ankle's given out. So he kept, so Dougie Shear, the equipment guy, came out and he said, Yeah, it's, that rivet just sheared right off. And so there's five minutes to go, and he goes, you know, I'd skate around a little bit. It was okay. Then i make a certain move. It would be – it would kind of buckle. I'm like – Brian's like, I'm not going to put Pete in. You're going to have to play – just do it. Do the best. <laughs> so I played the last five <laughs> minutes. I played the last five minutes with a broken rivet on my Lang goalie skate. You know, I think I had a well, couple shots. That had shots. to be stressful all by itself. Oh, my God. Totally. Uh, you know, I'm glad the Islanders didn't know what was going on, you know. They thought it was probably fixed, right? Oh, for crying any, out any, loud. of course they yeah. did. You're not going to send a goalie out there with a broken skate. Any pressure around the net or any East-West game I, or East-West play and I got a push, there was no way I was going to get it. Oh, for so crying out loud. Here it ends, go into the locker room, he puts a like a screwdriver, like a screw and a nut together and threw it in there and it was it was secure. And it lasted for four more periods, thankfully. And <laughs> yeah. Well, you have such a different perspective when you're a goalie. I, I think of the mid eighties and into the late eighties, some of the great players in the league for you, Bob, who was the best player that you ever faced? And maybe it was in practice. Maybe it was in a game, but the best NHL player you ever faced as a goalie. Oh, probably 99 and 66. Oh, uh, that's you know, pretty good picks right there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we played Pittsburgh all the time and Mario was, you know, very dangerous, probably more dangerous than Wayne. And then, you know, we were in the East, so we always played Pittsburgh and, but, I didn't play against Wayne a lot, just being, you know, in Edmonton. You'd be get him once, you get him twice a year. Um, so, you know, and then yeah, uh, got it. I mean, you had Dennis Savard in Chicago at the time. Danny was playing well. Uh, who the Rangers have? But there was those two was guys. It? it was always Mario. Was like he was. Wasn't great yet, but he was, you know, he was coming. Yeah. Yeah. And and back to Gretzky, like I looked at him and I watched him shoot the puck and his shot didn't look like much, but he found a way to score a lot of times from distance. And I'll, I'll never understand how, and maybe you didn't see him enough or regularly enough to understand it, but that guy could, maybe it's just the placement of the puck, but he found a way to score goals a lot of times from distance, and I could never figure out why the goalies couldn't stop it. Yeah, you know, through the 80s, it was there was a lot of rush plays at the net, you know, and he would 
you know, you'd get the rush. Yeah. Well, the classic goal is a shot on Vernon, you know, in the playoffs that year. Yes. You know, coming down and that's kind of, you know, he was a mid distance guy. He wasn't long range. It was mid distance. Uh, yep. and he could pick the, he could hit it. He could, he was accurate. I mean, that shot, I mean, God, if he misses that by a quarter inch, it's probably post and out or, or Vernie stopping it, but it was, it was just a perfect shot coming down, you know, like Mike, well, the other guy was Mike Bossy. He's the other guy I would put, throw into that category. Bossy scored. Yes. You know, he was sniping 50 a year. Um, you know, uh, so he was probably the guy. It was him and Mario, and then maybe Wayne. But Bossy was, I remember the first time his shot hit me was in Cap Center. He got, he got a shot in kind of a high slot, and that thing hit me, almost took my arm off. It was kind of, I mean, I made this save, but the thing just hit me, and I'm like, oh, my God. Then he come down that right side. He'd take that slapper. Same thing with Wayne, right? He'd yep. shoot that He'd shoot that mid-distance off the rush, slapper, top of the circle, inside top of the circle. He'd get you short side. He'd get you far corner. Yeah, all the time. He did it to me. He did it to Pat Riggin. He did it to Al Jensen. He did it to Pete Peters. So I wasn't the only cap guy he was, he was victimizing. But, uh, he was, and and uh, within the Capitals – like let's say practice, you had Mike Gartner, and I'll never forget Bill Clement was the analyst in in your game seven, the epic Easter battle uh, with the Islanders. And I don't know if it was that series or a different Caps playoff series, but Bill Clement uttered these words: "When Mike Gartner gets the puck alone in the slot, not even God can stop him." And he was paying tribute to what an adroit sniper Gartner was. So you've seen his shot. Why was he so good? He was another righty like Bossy. You know, he, you know, he he was like he was the original Jersey flapper going down the wing. You know, everybody's talking about yep. Madonna, but but Gardner was before that. His jersey would flap because he'd be so fast going down that oh. right side, and then he, you know, he was same thing. He'd take that slapper coming off that right dot, top of the circle, and he he'd snipe it. Yeah, but he just he got the puck off. You know, Darby ended up playing with him too in in Toronto, and and uh, he just get it off quick especially around, you know, the slot, you know, that area. Don't get it and hold it. Just shoot it. And that's Quick shot he, beats the hard shot. That's oh, always the mentality totally. of those good goal scorers. Yeah. And he, I thought there was know. a great line by Bill Clement, though. Not even God could stop him. I just – I'll never forget yeah. that. You know, I, I love old-school classic broadcasts, and I, I went back and watched some of your game uh, from the Easter Epic, and, you know, with Doc Emmerich and, and Bill Clement on the call, it's just – it, the the drama just oozes, and, and Emmerich had a way of making whatever game he was calling feel bigger than it was. But this was a game seven, and this was two teams that had gone back and forth. You mentioned it; you guys had that that series kind of within your grasp, and the Islanders were coming back, and this is past their their big run, and it just that game had such a big feel. And I think back then, Bobby, you know, nationally televised live hockey games were kind of new. You know, yeah. in, in the in, in the early 80s, we had to watch them on tape delay. I vividly remember the yeah. Islanders' first Stanley Cup victory over the Flyers. I watched it at 2 o'clock in the morning on, on ABC, on Channel 5 here locally in Minnesota, because it wasn't on live. This was live ESPN Easter weekend, and I think that also made this game seem as big as any game that we watched on, you know, an NHL side of things back in, in that era. It was incredible. Yeah, that was the only game in the league that night, too. It was all the yeah. other series had the yeah. night off or yeah. had been Over. decided. Yeah. And so this was center stage, literally, uh, you know, and, and a weekend where people are home from college and they're all, you know, gathered around the TV. And it was just such an awesome, awesome hockey game back and forth. Kelly Rudy played an amazing game. I think he ended up with what? 73. It was like 70, saves. And he, 70. Three out of seventy-five or something. I was 60, unbelievable. I mean, he was, sixty out of sixty-three or sixty-two out of sixty-four or something or five. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. He was making saves like crazy. Well, he had that you style know. too, where he didn't always look good doing it. Right? I mean, he yeah. was kind of out of position and flopping around, and and he just he battled always and moving, oh. always moving when the puck was coming. Yes, it was very you know, he, unorthodox. That, but, but back then, Gergi, we always we challenge on those those angle shots. You know the rush plays. Yep. You know it was like mm -hmm. going back to watching Jerry Cheevers with the Bruins. 
you know, <laughs> he, 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 he always had the glide lean going and he, you know, he'd shoot some on the ice. You're going to beat him. Cause you know, his feet weren't set. He's off balance then. Yeah. Well, that's exactly. the way we played. That's the way we played too. We were, we For were, sure. you know, we were stand up on our angles, butterfly in the middle. So you exactly how I played the game. I was, I was out as far as I could get and butterfly, you know, I grew up watching you. I, I watched Donnie Beaupre, you know, those were, you and Bo- Donnie Beaupre were two of the the best that I could find uh, watching games when it came to that butterfly style. And as you mentioned, we didn't have film. We didn't have internet. We just watched the games and tried to emulate the guys we were watching. And in the mid-80s, I was a college goalie at St. Thomas, and so I was watching you. I was watching Bobes, and I just would try to emulate the way you would move, the way you'd come out. Remember, you, you guys would come out, right, when you knew they were going to shoot the puck, that extra yeah. – Maybe step or half step to get into position was key. Oh, totally. Angles, cutting angles. Oh, that was a Warren Stralo I mean, special right there. Yeah, it gets, you know, it's, it's, I mean, still today, you, see, you know, a lot of coaches say, I don't want to see a stop and pucks in the blue paint. And most guys don't. You know, through all the guys I had, you know, most guys were better when they were at the edge, top of the blue paint, you know. If you're mm-hmm. sitting, stopping everything on the back, I mean, we were, I, w- I wasn't good that way. And more and I would say, get up, get up, get up. You know, and I, <laughs> you know, most of the guys always, but it worked, you know, because it, it, it did. You, yeah. You I, I used to go to his goalie schools and he'd have, he'd have that bench out on the ice. He'd have that, that camcorder and he'd videotape everything. And if you <laughs> went down, he was on you, like, get back up, get back up, get, I mean, totally different than what we watch. Now and again, the equipment's different. The guys are bigger, block and slide this, and it was a different game back then. But he was revolutionary with his angle work and how to how to manage around the net when you didn't have that big gear. When goaltenders weren't, you know, in our era, goaltenders weren't six foot four. You know, the average height of a goalie was five seven, five eight, five nine back then. You know, Darren Pang was an NHL goalie, and he wasn't five five, five or five six, right? I mean, five, it was a five. different time. Yeah, yeah crazy. Yeah, yeah it was. It was, uh, all those guys were small. Vernon was small. Kelly Rudy was small. Uh, Wamsley yep. was small. Uh, you know, I was, me and Barrasso were, I mean, Hextall were, we were three big ones. Billy Smith was small. You know, they were all under six feet. You know, Pelly Lindbergh, uh, Bob Froze, uh, Richter, Van Beesbrook. They were all, they're all not even six foot. All those yeah. Guys. Six foot goalies and above were, were not the norm. It was the exact opposite. Yeah. Totally. Which is crazy to think about now because if you're under six feet now, Alex Stalock's one of the few I can think about that is like okay, you're 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 the unicorn. You're the one that stands out. It's just it's flipped completely. Oh yeah. Six one, you were a giant back in the eighties. Now you're a just a midget, you know, you're just not yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it is. It's nuts. Crazy. We're going to close the conversation out, Bobby, with the the hat trick hot seat. I've got three questions lined up for you. There's no wrong answer. That's the beauty of the the hot seat. Uh, we just put you on the spot with something that comes to mind, top of the head. And and I I don't know if our listeners know this, but we all do know that goaltenders are the best athletes, and it's no shock that Bob Mason is a scratch golfer. I don't care what his handicap card says; the guy's a scratch. So if you're out there and you want to play for money, he'll have to give you a stroke. So with that in mind. Yeah. Your dream foursome right now, if you if you can book a foursome this spring and and have th- any three people that are living right now on the planet join you to make up your foursome, what's it going to be? Wow. That's a, probably my brother, Billy. Of course. Myself. I'd have to maybe go Tiger Woods. Great pick. And maybe the old legend. I've, I've, I've shaken, had to, some pictures with Mr. Nicholas, but uh, oh, that'd I know cool. he doesn't. But back in his prime, yeah. But, uh, yeah. Um, Even in his 80s, the Golden Bear would be pretty cool to play with. He might not play all 18, but just to have him out there and, and be able to talk golf with the, the Golden Bear would be pretty cool. Yeah. So that'd be good for some. All right, my next yeah. question is, if you've got a night like tonight where let's just say you've got a couple hours to kill at home and you're going to you're gonna watch your very favorite sports-related movie, what movie would you watch tonight, Bobby Mason? Slapshot. 
I knew it. Of course. <laughs> it had to be, right? It had to be. Oh, oh God. And that movie still, I, I got to tell you, it still <laughs> holds up. I mean, it's just awesome. It is awesome. I've been on those bus rides, Gorgi. <laughs> so have I. Yeah, I played yeah. in the USHL. I remember those bus rides vividly and, and, uh, and some Bruce, of the personalities. And Bruce, Bruce would fill us in uh, the intimate stories that he had when he was filming on set. He was so proud. Bruce Boudreau was so proud of the fact that they picked out his apartment. His apartment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's where Reg Dunlop supposedly uh, lived, and it was just a complete shithole. Uh, but Bruce was so proud of that. Anytime the movie came up, he would make sure he'd work that into the conversation and Knowing Bruce, and we both know him quite well, and watching him, um, it does not surprise me that that was his place. Because, man, that place was messy. Holy cow! Yeah, that's, that's uh, fit him to a T right there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. I'll let you get on with your day. Um, you know, when you live in International Falls, it's it's probably a long ride to the closest concert venue. But I I would love to know your very first concert that you attended at the deck in Duluth. Oh boy. 1981 all in oats. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. My good friend, Paul Allen, PA, uh, a race caller out of Canterbury. That's his very favorite, uh, group to go see. And, and, yep. uh, at the deck, Bobby, at the deck, that venue had to be so cool for a concert, the way those seats kind of overhang, I'm sure where the stage was. That had to be pretty cool. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. You know, they were just. Uh, that was like eighty one. I don't. They were big back then, but oh, huge! Yeah, he hit a ton of ton of hits. That, that duo. Uh, yeah, I. I don't know. We probably had some beers. I can't remember the whole thing, but. Uh, <laughs> I think it was probably in the spring. You know, hockey was over. I think. So it was a yeah. It was a night out. All I would notes. never have guessed Hall Oates. I I would have guessed. Um, a lot of other '80s classic rock bands before I would have got where you went, but that's the beauty of the question, and and you never forget your first concert. Mine was at the uh, the Met Center. It was Brian Adams warming up for Journey. I want to say '82, '83. Wow. Talk about a great double dip, right? I mean that that's a memorable concert, and to this day, Journey is still my very favorite band. I still, even though. Steve Perry is no longer the lead singer. I still go out and see him as much as I can. They're coming again here in the calendar year. I'll be back at the X to see them. But no, you don't forget that first concert experience when you're a kid. That's a big deal. Yeah. Those, all three of those guys are rock and roll hall of famers. So Gorgie, we, we picked a yep. good twosome there, threesome there. Yeah. We had good taste. Yeah, yeah. We had good taste in the early eighties. That's for sure. Well, Bob, <laughs> again, thank you so much for, for being a part of wooden sticks. I love, catching up with you. I, I, you, you brought me back to all those conversations, whether it was on the road with the wild, or I would text you at these weird hours to get some kind of nugget for the broadcast. And you've always, I, I've always loved picking your brain and hearing your insight. And I think most wild fans can, can hear it come through here in this conversation today. Um, you don't last 18 years in that position in the national hockey league and make it through all those coaching changes unless you're, really good at your job, which you've always been. And um, just love catching up today. So thanks for, for being on the show. Yeah. Thanks for the invite. Appreciate it. And uh, keep up the good work. I watched a lot of wild games. You're you still got a little guys are always giving a little jab once in a while. That's because they like <laughs> you, Gorgie. They like you. They're good guys. And yeah, yeah I, I, I'm very blessed. I, uh, I enjoy the gig and it's always the most fun when they get in the playoffs. I know this year it's likely not going to end up that way, but uh, I think, brighter days are ahead for this team. And so uh, we'll keep plugging away and, and hope that they can um, in the next couple of years, make a legitimate cup run. And, and again, Bob Mason, big part of the, the best run in wild history back in 2003, the crazy wins over Colorado and Vancouver before running into Jean Sebastian Jaguer. Ugh, I hate even saying the name, but uh, we'll be back after this quick break. You're listening to wooden sticks here on the talk North network. All right, we are back on Wooden Sticks as we tie the show up with the final segment here and really appreciate having uh, Bob Mason join us today. Fun to hear some of those stories and uh, the twinkle in Jacques Lemaire's eye as he used to talk about 
uh, his team, specifically those goaltending decisions. I remember vividly, I'm not even sure Bob knows this. I probably should have brought this up, but you know, morning skate, there's always be a presser with each coach. And so Jacques Lemaire would get done putting the boys through the paces and he'd come into the, the media room and the out of town media didn't know Jacques like we did. And we knew him well enough not to ask the question because it was clear that he would never tell you the answer. So why ask? And it was always who was in goal. So somebody invariably uh, after each morning skate, especially when we were in St. Paul would, you know, ask the question, Hey coach, who's your goalie tonight? And we would all cringe because as local media, we knew that the answer was not going to come and it probably was going to irritate the head coach. And, but Jock would handle it the same way each and every time he'd stop, pause, look at the, uh, the person who asked the question said, I don't know, but it will be one of the two we have. And he would move on to the next question and be coy about it. And, you know, Bob was a big part of that coaching staff that, that would make that choice. In fact, Jacques Lemaire would lean on Bob Mason, as he alluded to in our conversation today. So that was fun going back to UMD and hearing about uh, not only playing for the Bulldogs, but seeing the great Hall and Oates at that same spot at the deck where he played his college hockey and, Loved his time in Chicago. I have great memories as a North Star fan driving down there to watch North Star Blackhawk games back in the day. In Minnesota, we chanted Secord sucks. And in Chicago, they chanted Dino sucks. And I vividly remember those those uh, dinosaur blow-up dolls you got at the local Sinclair station. They were all over the Twin Cities. And when you went to a North Star game at the Met Center, you'd see those Dino blow-up dolls everywhere. In Chicago, they'd be there too. And unfortunately, they'd be hanging from a stick with some string tied to it to make it look like a noose. They weren't very nice to Dino at Chicago stadium. They weren't very nice to me when I wore my Mike Madonna Jersey down there somewhere around what? 1991, the same year he was a rookie, the same year they went on to uh, make a run at the cup. I had some beer dumped on me at old Chicago stadium, but great to hear Bob Mason's memories of living there and just fun to connect with a goaltender. I love talking to, to former goalies. I'm hoping to have Josh Harding on here later in the next couple of weeks. Josh just completed a great run at Edina with Kurt Giles on that coaching staff. And actually Josh was a left-handed goalie and had a chance to coach a lefty uh, that led him to stay at Edina. I've connected with uh, Jordan Leopold. The Gophers are getting ready for an NCAA run here. We hope that will end in St. Paul at the frozen four Jordan Leopold about a, a part of a Gopher team that won a national championship on local soil. So that'll be another guest to keep an eye out for in the, uh, the coming weeks here on wooden sticks. We want you to be a part of the show. Uh, I've mentioned her name before. She's outstanding. Her name is Karen Cleary. Email her at K C L E A R Y K Cleary at talknorth.com and be a part of this show. We'd love to have you as a sponsor, elevate your business, bring more people to where you are. We can do that right here. The hockey community is a tight knit bunch that supports their own. So get involved here on Wooden Sticks. We had a great time today chatting with Bob Mason. You can listen to all our shows. They're downloadable every single day. It started with Lou Nanny. We've gone through some terrific guests. I strongly recommend you listen to the GM of the Minnesota P-Dub team uh, in Natalie Darwitz. We had Rachel Ramsey on. Just some fantastic guests that you can listen to. Hope you've enjoyed the show today, connecting with Bob Mason. I'm Kevin Gorg. We'll catch you next time right here on Talk North right here on Wooden Sticks.